excited uh, to bring up our next speakers. I don't know how they're going to do this thing because there's two of them, but they are overtly libertarian. In fact, so libertarian, they've got a podcast called We Are Libertarians. Please give it up for the awesome Chris Spangle and Greg Lenz. guys one mic? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so my joke. All right, now you hide that somewhere. Don't make me hide it. And then I'm just going to stand here and talk like this for the entire time. Is that okay with everybody? This is how we podcast. All right. <laughs> My name is Chris Spangl. I am uh, affectionately known as Dear Leader of the We Are Libertarians podcast. This is my co-host, Greg Lenz. Uh, Greg, we are both former scumbag Republicans. Former scumbag Republicans. Chris even made it a point to raise money for Dick Cheney to support the truth. That's true. Oh, that's, God. God. <laughs> that's a lie. That's a smear. Okay? You, Wrong. You are worse than Hillary Clinton. <laughs> I did start out as a scumbag Republican. I, I started out at IUPUI as head of the College of Republicans in 2004. Please don't hold that against me. We all do things in college we're not proud of. Mine was supporting George W. Bush for re-election. Uh, I ended up getting involved in a campaign for Congress for a local Republican. Uh, I didn't go help Mitch Daniels or George W. Bush. I helped a, a libertarian-leaning Republican named Andy Horning. Uh, surprise, I was the only college Republican chair not to get a job in the Daniels administration. I don't know how that happened. Well, you wouldn't uh, be a libertarian if you were employed anyway. Right. So, <laughs> we, so I started out as a, a scumbag Republican, and I, I almost got impeached because that was the year of gay marriage, and I didn't really care if gay people got married, or I just didn't think it was an issue. It didn't seem to make any sense. Yeah. Uh, I didn't necessarily, I, I thought George Bush's immigration plan was fine. And now I'm practically open borders, much to his chagrin. Uh, and I uh, started moving down the libertarian path as a result. And I worked for Abdul Hakim Shabazz on Abdul in the Morning. I was a radio show producer at, in uh, Indianapolis on 1040. I worked there for uh, 1430. I worked there for four years. I became more and more libertarian. The one piece that I was missing was the foreign policy. I just quite couldn't get there. I really still wanted to bomb brown people. And I was watching the debates and I saw that there was this old cranky guy that I had spent months on the radio making fun of. And there's tapes too. There's a lot of tapes. So many tapes I can never run for office. In the Fed. Woo -hoo! Yeah. And so, but he started to make more sense. And I started to follow the Libertarian Party and I thought, why don't they have it together? <laughs> And it turned out they hadn't had an executive director for three years. So I went to work for the Libertarian Party of Indiana as their executive director for four years. I uh, had a great time, uh, several people that I know who, who uh, through that experience. While I was there, I started the podcast, We Are Libertarians, in an effort to reach uh, college kids. And uh, then went on to work as the marketing director for the Advocates for Self-Government. If you've handed out the quiz, that is the Advocates for Self-Government. If you've never seen the quiz, the guy who replaced me when I left will be happy to give you one of the quizzes. His name's Lil Brett Bittner, and he will quiz you at your own pace. Yeah. <laughs> if you listen to We Are Libertarians, backlog. Inside yeah. jokes work best when they haven't listened to That's exactly right. <laughs> and uh, I left there. I now work for the Bob and Tom Show in Indianapolis, and uh, then that's how Brett got here, and we podcast. Yeah, we podcast once a week. We try to cover current events. Um, what I've always found, I got drug into this because I had content for a news website. I needed daily content. And he, in true libertarian fashion, wanted to siphon it off without providing it himself. So yeah. he asked me if I'd provide it. I, I stole it because there's no such thing as copyright. Repurposed it. Right. <laughs> repurposed it. So, so I he liberated your content. You did. You liberated it. And then we got to talking politics. And so you invited me on to fill in one day in his basement apartment in the very nice Cholo run apartments of South Southern. It was dank. Yeah. <laughs> it was a dank apartment. Yes, it uh, was. It was. My ex wife lives. Yes. Now. And I really thought you were Monte Teo for a while because she was never there. And every <laughs> time I'd come over, I'd be like, oh, look, there's no one in the bedroom. Which I am a libertarian. I haven't seen a woman in several months. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I did. Uh, yeah. And so Chris invited me on and I never left. It was, it was, the, it was the most interesting discovery process on earth. I, I'd always been an innate libertarian. I'm not. The, somebody that I was a Republican because my parents were Republicans. They were great suburban white Methodists, you know, God, guns, and country. And so it was tough to shed that, but I also 
knew that I really didn't care about social issues. I wanted a, a, a hospitable economic environment and live and let live. And so I didn't know where I fit, and that doesn't fit in the Republican Party anymore. The Republican Party has undergone a transition that is pretty radical. It's trying to decide whether it's going to take a libertarian shift or if it's going to be the party of white people and nostalgia. And that's the toughest thing to overcome because the people of white, the party of white people and nostalgia vote, and our generation doesn't. Overwhelmingly, millennials are. We are the libertarian generation. We don't show up. We're not part of the political process yet. When we are, we can change whatever agent or whatever agency or party we want to take over. Then we can define it. We will write the future, and we will govern. But until that day, we're kind of stuck being hamstrung from policies from yesteryear. And that's why we do this. We are not um, for everybody. And we, have, we don't try to. We are, we are uh, irreverent. We are offensive. Some might call us deplorable. Yes. <laughs> but what we try to do is libertarianism, it's so easy to get stuck on the phil uh, philosophy. It's so logically consistent, you can't imagine someone grasping it and not just reaching this conclusion. What's different, though, is it's tough to do that and make it funny and not say no to everything. And so I know since we've worked on Grillo Friends now for four years, it's been a, an approach where how does this apply, not what are we supposed to believe. Right. And then it's also it's about fun, because if you don't start and have things that are fun, you're never going to get a big enough crowd and get people to trust you and like you that you'll have positive momentum that grows where it's not an organization dependent upon people and personalities. So it's about creating a self-sustaining organization not one like, for instance, Apple Computer, where Steve Jobs was everything. He was the R&D department, and the second he was gone, it's a slow descent. I love fun. Yeah. I have fun all the time. Oh, boy. Take that. No. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. So We Are Libertarians is, uh, our tagline is, and all the irreverence modern politics deserve, because we believe that fun, much like uh, Liberty and Chill, he has, uh, every Friday night, Brett Bittner hosts a gathering uh, where it's not political. Politics ends up happening, but it's just a group of people getting together and having fun. It's not a group of people sitting down going, <coughs> how many, uh, did you know that Jekyll Island was the foundation of the Federal Reserve, and then, not, uh, and then if they don't Quote agree with you, or switch tables. Right. <laughs> if they don't agree with you, then you kick them out. It has to be a welcoming environment. And so what we try to do is we have about 20 millennial libertarians of all different stripes that we bring in, and we like to argue with each other, but at the end of the day, we leave friends. We even have Rob Kendall, a loudmouth Trump supporter, who is mostly ridiculous, largely ridiculous, on the podcast, because we find that arguing with Rob not only sharpens our arguments against him, but also his arguments against us. And that's how I became a libertarian. And because and I it's was because you couldn't disagree with me. Right. Uh, you, were, you were right. I knew you were right. But... I was on the winning side, and I could flaunt that and just pound my chest. But eventually, that gets old. But you get to tired do, of just being wrong. To do that, you have to have the spirit of openness. And so many libertarians don't have a spirit of openness. They want to preach. They want to tell you the right things to believe. That's not how you get people to change their mind. You get people changed by to change their mind by doing what? You help them discover. It's the the problem of the discovery process was when you tell them what to think there's gonna be a natural apprehension. You can't tell anyone or create a libertarian through programming. You know, they're already gonna be naturally suspicious because you're not someone they look to already for advice. But if you help them flush out their beliefs, you don't do it in, with an antagonistic nature. You do it where you say, well, what if you consider the opposite? Or tell me what you believe, and then ask them, well, how did you come to that conclusion? Lead them down the well, and eventually, I truly believe that if you ask the right questions, and you ask them, is it really right to force anyone to do anything they don't want to do? When it's not a political process and when it's just an individual in a one-on-one -on -one environment or a small group environment, no one really wants to apply force to force anyone to do anything. But the mob mentality, it becomes us versus them. But you can create libertarians through the discovery process of questions, the Socratic method. Right, and so that leads us to our final point. And as I talk, please take out your cell phones. Going to do something unprecedented. Take out your cell phones, go to Facebook, and like We Are Libertarians on Facebook. <laughs> if you have a podcast app, download the podcast and listen to it. Uh, if you're under 40, you'll like it. If you're over 40, you might not. <laughs> uh, the final note is you have to be prepared. You have to know your stuff. 
What led me to libertarianism is that I was arguing with Andy Horning, who had been a libertarian for many, many years, and Abdul Hakim Shabazz, who was a lawyer and a Republican, a, a socially liberal Republican, not necessarily libertarian, but he challenged all of my little Rush Limbaugh uh, catchphrases, and I couldn't argue with him, and that led me to a sense of frustration, because he would let me beat up against his ideas, and I couldn't counter them, that led me to libertarianism. At the end of the day, we're right, but you have to know your stuff to argue with people, and you have to approach it from that spirit of openness, but also a spirit of offense. You have to let, you have to say, Greg, you know, why do you think we should build a wall? <laughs> Prove to me that a wall is a good idea. Hillary Clinton has one. Okay. <laughs> Instead of going, well, I think that the wall is a bad idea because I said, no, you proved that the wall is the good idea. I'm coming from a sense of offense. I'm not saying, well, here's why the wall is a bad idea, and I'm going to point out all the reasons that I'm smarter than you. I'm saying, no, you tell me why the wall is a good idea because the truth is when you're on Facebook and you're having those arguments or you're on campus and you're tabling, they don't know what they're talking about at every, all. Every time you're telling someone to Google something, like last night, if you guys watched the debate, Trump did, or Hillary did it, and so did Trump. Go to my website, Google this. When you're having to do that, you're losing. You've already lost, <laughs> it's over. You need to be able to help them flush out what they believe, not point to information or point them in the right direction. When you can do that, you will create as many libertarians as you want. That's sort of the panacea we've been looking for. But until we get to that point, be fun, be relaxed. It's so easy, I've struggled with this, to be the condescending libertarian know-it-all. You know, I love this stuff. It's nerdy as hell. It's down the rabbit hole. It's logically perfect. I can already picture what it will look like in NCAP society. With Don't my let black the backwards hat and the bro yeah. outfit fool you. Yeah. He's a nerd. Oh, okay. huge nerd. Huge, huge nerd. nerd. And so the key, I could go down that, that rabbit hole and I have to consciously not because everyone zones out and nobody cares. So at the end of the day, you have to prey upon their own vanity. They want to know what they believe. And for the most part, people don't have time or the interest in their uh, personal lives to really sit down and say, what is my personal political philosophy? What do I believe in? You know, not, that's just not the, for most people, that's not what they spend time doing. They end up getting these philosophies through osmosis from their friends or through the social groups they associate with. It is purely a situation where we have to hack the system through social, just like this, and Brandon did a great job. Just an environment like this is how you hack the system, you make it fun, and that's how you create libertarians. Means. And internet memes. Yeah, memes are it. That's <laughs> Sometimes just. Uh, and, and finally, I would just say that don't give up. Yeah. Uh, I've been in the libertarian movement for 10 years, and when I switched from being the producer of a, ra a radio show, a Republican radio show, and I had state representatives sending me Christmas cards, and Republican state representatives walking up and giving me big hugs, because I had a, I had a position of power, and I left that position to go be the executive director of the Libertarian Party of Indiana, a position <coughs> largely without any power. Six dollars an hour. Six dollars an hour is James Neese. This is James Neese. I told you you'd recognize him when he got here. He was the guy that had to pee. Right. And <laughs> I didn't have power, but I knew that I was doing what was right. And I took a lot of crap from my peers. I have heard the wasted argument vote more times than – it's an infinitesimal amount of times. <laughs> But I don't care anymore because you get over that and you learn to argue that. And at a certain point, if you can turn that around on the offensive and get them to realize that they're not voting according to their principles, they're not voting in accordance with their morals, values, and principles, then that light bulb for them turns on just like it has for you. And what you are seeing this election cycle is that a light bulb is turning on for so many more people. And for those of us who have been in the libertarian movement for so long, to, uh, we have a, a podcast called the Gary Johnson for President podcast. I'm not advocating, I'm saying that's the name of the podcast for uh, the IRS, which may or may not be listening. Uh, I, did a, I did that four <laughs> years ago. And I collect, I basically rip off YouTube videos of Gary Johnson's interviews. Maybe a dozen in all of 2008 or 2012. It's a dozen a week. The, the tide is shifting. If you look at any measurable number of the libertarian movement, we are growing amongst independents. We are growing amongst millennials. A third of the millennial generation are libertarians. We are the future, 
and you just have to be patient. It's a long process to build a movement. It isn't, a, it isn't self gratifying most of the time. Although those Rothbardian debates, that's great mental masturbation. But you will win. You just have to be patient. And so if you have an event where you have two people show up, who cares? Because at some point you're going to have one where 300 people show up, and that's the win. It is all about moving forward. And then it's really happening. It is happening. It is. We're it's so happening right now. It is. Uh, so just keep the faith. Be prepared. Share internet memes. Yep. Be open. Be fun. Be lighthearted. This and is, this is very prepared. serious, but there's no way of making it serious and getting people to notice. You have to do it in an indirect way. So the more fun it is, the more libertarian you can create. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chris and Greg, for We Are Libertarians.